I've done this church thing for a long time now, and I think I've got something important to say about it, about your expectations, and about you. Here's the deal with the church you are in right now. There could be something deep in your heart that changes today. We hope for that. In fact, we pray for that. But honestly, in my experience, the chances are, well, kind of slim. Now, I know that sounds a bit harsh, even blunt, but I don't know if there's much that can really change a person in 60 minutes. We all know that real change takes a lifetime. They'll ask you to focus on God, and that's a great thing. But it'll be almost impossible to really focus, especially with everything going on in your life. They'll ask you not to be apathetic. I assure you, nobody's apathetic about Jesus. You've just heard this message over and over. Now, I really don't want to sound negative, so when they sing, sing along. When they pray, close your eyes. And when they study the Bible, follow along. But as you do these things, my advice to you is simple. Really simple. Be careful how much you allow your heart to lean in. To lean in toward God. To lean in toward the other people in the room. Oh, there will be a time for you to lean in more, but it might not be today. So hey, thanks for taking the time to listen. I don't consider myself an expert or anything. I've just been around long enough to have a little experience in the church. I hope you have a great day and that this church meets your expectations. And if you need anything at all, or you just want to talk, I'll be around. Woo! Huh? Man, I tell you what, our enemy is tricky, isn't he? And uh, actually the word the Bible uses that we'll look at in in a little bit is crafty. Uh, But the truth is we have an enemy who loves to play into all the things we think, who loves to play into all of our feelings and fears and insecurities. Uh, This week, when I watched that for the very first time, I, I, I immediately said to Pastor Jeremy, you need to play that again right now because I want to watch all of those words uh, with this filter knowing that that character is Satan. And uh, man, I tell you what, it hit different. And so we are actually going to, at the end of the message, show that one more time so you can see it knowing kind of the filter that we're, we're watching uh, that through. Man, after today and next week, when we get to the end of this series on our enemy, when this is over, there's one thing I really hope that is burned into your minds and into your hearts and into your lives, and it's these words from Ephesians 6 that tell us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, as we think about that, there's, there's a, a number of thoughts that we've thought about together these last couple weeks, right? The first one is, if it wears skin, three of you remembered that? It's not your enemy, right? If it has skin on, it's not our enemy enemy. Uh, And the the other thought, the main thought from week one is that we actually have an enemy and the enemy isn't you, right? You're not just your own worst enemy and oh man, if I just did a little better or worked a little harder or tried a little more. No, we actually have an enemy and this enemy's goal is our complete destruction. He is trying to devour us. And then last week we learned a little bit more about who our enemy is was and where he came from we learned that this enemy of ours was actually one of god's top advisors and he was beautiful and radiant and compelling which is why his lies are so convincing right for us even still today but he didn't he wasn't satisfied just being kind of on god's staff he really wanted to be god and so he fell Um, If we're going to follow God, I think it's unbelievably important for us to sort of shift away from a place of apathy where we yawn and we we don't focus and we don't care to a place of being fully aware and realizing that we actually have an enemy. 
uh, we need to know that we have opposition. And because and one of our enemy's goals is for us to fall asleep to that idea, right? If we're just sort of sleepy, to, oh, I don't really know if, if that's really real or if that's just something that, that people say or have said or whatever, you know, um, it makes it a lot easier for our enemy to get us if we actually don't think that he's real, if we go to sleep on that idea. Uh, and so today, uh, I want us to spend some time today thinking about our enemy's tactics, right? What, how, how does he operate? What does he do? How does he try to get us? And, and we're going to look at some very broad strokes, but I also want you to have some specific handholds as well. If you, I know like in church, typically this isn't like what you're encouraged to do, but if you have a smartphone in your pocket uh, or sitting on the seat beside you or whatever, I want you to take it out because I want you to take a picture of this next slide we're going to put up. Here's some specific things. I want to just sort of very quickly talk through this, but I think this would be a great resource. We'll actually put it on on Facebook later as well. So if you want to grab it from my page or New Hope's page, it'll be in both those locations as well if you don't have a device here. Uh, but it talks about our enemy's tactics. So the enemy's mission, one, is to wage war against those who obey God's commands, right? Uh, that's, that's what he's up to. Uh, two, to, to steal, to kill, and destroy. Three, to discourage and keep people from being effective for God. Uh, the next one, to deceive and distort the truth, right? We, we're told that he is the father of lies. Um, uh, the next one, to influence the way people behave. He wants us to act in certain ways. We'll look at a little bit about that today. He wants to tempt and seduce people into sin, right? Which basically means God says it, but we don't want to go with what God says. We're just going to do our own thing or something different. And then the last one is to accuse God's children. And, and here's the good news. While we have an enemy and this enemy is real and he's powerful and he wants to destroy us, we don't need to be afraid. All we really need to do is to be aware of what his schemes are, what he's up to, so that we can, as we're really going to lean into next week, stand against those things effectively. That slide actually was, was sent to me uh, by Bethany here at New Hope for years now, we've actually had what we call a freedom ministry, and, uh, and it's been an awesome, powerful thing. We haven't really like talked about it like in a, hey, everybody should do this, rah, rah, but it's this powerful process that helps us to, instead of letting our enemy take and lean into some of the woundings and scars and brokenness from the experiences of our past, instead of letting our enemy get a foothold in those things, it helps us to, to refocus on God and let Him set us free. So just know if that's something that uh, you're like, huh, that could be maybe a, a benefit and a blessing to me, talk to Bethany and she'll, she'll let you know some more information about that. So last week, Laura said this. She was up on stage and uh, we were at the end, you know, and, and we, all, we had all this tech stuff failing last week. It was terrible. Um, no screens. And so Laura said, I loved it. It was perfect. She said, so we're doing a series on our enemy. Is it any wonder that we would face some opposition, right? That our enemy would actually be attacking. Because it makes sense, doesn't it? If we're going to shine light on our enemy... It seems like he wouldn't like that, and if he could shut it down, if he could make enough stuff break to cause us to back off a little bit, that'd be a good thing for him, right? And so last week, uh, guys, this is, this is crazy. So we've had some faithful people who have been contributing money literally for years. We, we had just gotten to the place where we were going to be able to replace our cameras, our screens, our projectors, uh, and we were like this close, like literally a day from pulling the trigger on that. Um, and then all of a sudden, one piece of equipment blew up last week that uh, to replace is going to cost somewhere between fifteen and $25,000. Uh, we have a stinking enemy, right? 
Yeah, yeah, but, but you should be, like, yeah, Bud's like, hey, amen, hey, amen, we have an enemy, right? Bud's the one who says, when we say, we got to write a really big check, he's like, you know, so that's, uh, man, it's, it's crazy all the things our enemy does and how he tries to sort of, to, to get our focus off of Jesus. He loves to attack. This, this last week, um, last weekend, uh, and I had two blocks this last week that were like this, where the, I, I went to, to, I woke up one day, and before I went to sleep, not that same day, but the next day, uh, over these two, on two separate uh, days, I had 42-hour windows where I was up 39 of those hours. Uh, and it wasn't because I was doing fun stuff, it was just because life was happening. And, and so that happened last weekend. And I thought as I was starting the week, oh man, I like, this is like one of the busiest weeks I have in my memory. And then the week instantly got way busier. Sleep, energy. I've heard numerous people talking about sickness, just busyness, things trying to pull our focus and attention and distract us, right? We have an enemy and he wants to keep us from focusing on jesus and, and yet as people of faith our our really our only goal is in in the midst of all those circumstances no matter what it's to keep our eyes on jesus it's to keep our lives pointed at and focused on jesus this is what we must keep doing I was given some tickets uh, for the Casting Crowns concert on Monday, and one of the things they said at the concert, which I thought was so good, was this. The guy said, I don't worship God because today is good. Because you think that, right? Oh, it's such a good day. God, thanks so much for all the blessings. No, 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 no. Because life sometimes isn't good, right? Like not every day is awesome, right? Anybody else, right? 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 So I don't worship God because today is good. I worship because God is good even today. No matter what circumstances we may be facing. And so Jesus, today I just want to pray as, as we lean in this week and as we, we think together about the tactics of our enemy, the things that, that he has used and continues to use to try to mess us up and trip us up and pull us down. God, I just pray that we would become more keenly aware. God, that we could see when our enemy is coming and we could see what he is doing and that we would be able to even more successfully keep our eyes on Jesus and take a stand. God, may this be the fruit of what we're talking about today and next week. We ask together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I want us to drop into a few places at the very beginning of the Bible. The first one is, is the place we typically think of when we think of sin and we think of the fall. It is the Genesis 3 fall. And I want you guys to, to listen to these words. Very, very familiar passage. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, uh, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves." Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. 
And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then from there, we actually see the consequences of these choices for the serpent, for Adam, and for Eve, and literally for all of humanity, the, the uh, consequences of this initial fall. And it started with uh, one seemingly simple question, right? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? right? I mean, it kind of sort of, it sounds simple, it sounds innocent even, but it kind of undermines things. Jesus, like God, God wouldn't really say something like that, would he? I mean, I don't think this is true, but maybe, I mean, maybe God is trying to keep something from you, something important, something that you would enjoy, something you would benefit from. And of course, we love to add to what God says, don't we? As people of faith, because watch this, what, how, does, uh, how does Eve respond? But God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And then she adds to it, and you must not even touch it or you will surely die. Right? God never said don't touch it. But again, don't we do this all the time? God says this, and then we add like layers of extra things to, in order to kind of insulate and keep people from ever getting to the thing God actually said. The problem when we do this is that people start to think, oh man, well God said this, and when they realize he never said that, it creates confusion. We should stop doing things like that, church. But then after this, there's this gotcha moment, right? Where this, the snake says, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, come on. I, I'm sure they did this. Have you ever done this? Ooh. I would like to be like God, right? Like this temptation to be bigger, better, stronger, more powerful, more intelligent, more whatever, wealthier. Come on, anybody? Right? Especially because we need some of that to build, you know, whatever. You know, like we all want that, right? Um, this is a temptation for everyone. Uh, and, and so here, this is really fascinating to me because it's not like this snake shows up and, and he's like, hey, listen, don't follow God, follow me. If I asked you guys, who here today wants to make a declaration that you are going to not follow God, but you're going to follow Satan? Most of you would not raise your hand, right? Um, uh, many of you might say, I'm going to follow God. Some of you might go, well, okay, yeah, I want to sort of do good and be a better person. But, you know, are those things really real? Are those people really real? And then we have others who are like, you know what, Rob, I don't really follow God or the devil, because I don't really know what I think or feel about those things. I follow something different. So listen, the tactic here was to make this life all about you and all about me. Because here's how we think, right? Well, I have learned. I have grown. I just know. And so, you know, I don't need some God or some enemy. I can just do it all on my own. It's all about you and what you think and what you want. Now, uh, I, got, I got an example of, of deception that kind of came to me this week. So we, we tend to put people into two sort of big groups, don't we? So on the one hand, we have those people who are weird and strange and needy and crazy. Right? Come on. Every one of you in here has done this. I guarantee it, right? Hey, babe, so-and-so said, asked if we wanted to have dinner or do something. You want to do that? Oh, oh my gosh. Those people are crazy. Do we really have to do? Come on, right? Some of you were like, yeah, you invited us and you're the crazy one, right? 
And then on the other hand, we have people who are like, I don't need anything from anyone because I've got this and I can manage it all on my own, right? And, and we all kind of aspire to be that second group and try really, really hard not to be the first group, right? Okay, but here's the truth. Can I say the truth? All right. Every single one of us at some place, at some time, in some ways, quite likely way more than we would feel comfortable admitting, we all are those weird, strange, crazy people. Amen? Amen. And none of us, Literally none of us, I don't care how smart you are, I don't care how much money you have, none of us can keep it all together, all on our own, all the time. It's just not possible. And yet, like did you notice, when God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and he's calling out to Adam, hey, where are you? And, and what is Adam doing? What is Eve doing? They're hiding. God's tactic here is to get all of us to hide from him because when we hide, what happens? All of a sudden, the enemy's lies to us are way more believable. They're way bigger. They're more powerful. They're more real. What God always wants is for us to reject that hiding, reject that isolation, and actually to lean into community, right? To, to run to God, to exist with other people. Uh, so don't just hide because it's all about you and how you're feeling and what's up with you. Lean into something bigger. Now let's see the results of this Genesis 3 fall when we may take our eyes off God and we make things all about us. Uh, Genesis 3, 7 says this, Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I love this, right? So all of a sudden, this, this horrible thing happens. And their best solution, they pick these fig leaves and kind of use them as coverings. Their best solution, as soon as they picked it, was dying, right? Like it wasn't, it, it didn't fix the problem. And, and it's not even like God was trying to keep knowledge from his people, right? It's not like he didn't want them to know about good and evil. But just like any good earthly parent knows, right? We all know this. Like there's a time, there's a maturity level, and there's a proper path for gaining knowledge, right? Like nobody walks up to their three-year-old kid and says, hey, let me teach you about fire. And oh, by the way, here's a lighter. So just you know, click it wherever you want and set whatever you want on fire, you're going to learn a lot of stuff, right? Of course not. They can't manage that. It doesn't make any sense. And so when we demand God's knowledge on our own terms at the time we want it, instead of waiting for the time that he is going to give it to us in his time and in his way, uh, and, and we're just willing to gain it at any cost, the result is always exposure and disappointment. It's always like, right? Because all of a sudden now they're like, ah, <laughs> we're naked, right? They, they, they want to hide. Uh, what starts happening with them at this point? Uh, it's like uh, they, were, they were perfect. Everything was just great. They make it all about them and what they want. And all of a sudden, when God's like, Adam, what's going on? He's like, it's the woman, right, that you gave me. It's her fault. And then he's like, Eve, what have you done? And she's like, it's the snake, right? Like everybody's blaming everybody and nobody is taking responsibility for their own decisions and leaning back into God and community. Um, now, that, that's the fall that we all know about, but there's actually two more falls that we see early in Genesis uh, that also exposed some other key tactics of our enemy. Do you guys want to hear about those two? Good response. Right answer. All right, so there's the Genesis 3 fall. Next is the Genesis 6 fall. And, and it's just very short. Let me read these words over you. Some of you know these. Some of them you, you may not. But listen, it says this. 
when humans began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, very interesting when the Bible uses terms like that and you're like, well, who are they? What are that, what's that talking about? The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful. I don't even need to read anymore. Anybody ever gotten in trouble just because of that? It's like you see someone, you go, <laughs> right? And that leads to all sorts of stuff. Uh, and they married any of them they chose. So it's basically like, you're really hot, you're mine, right? That's kind of what's going on here. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be uh, 125 years the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were heroes of old, men of great renown. Now, what in the world is going on here? Because it sort of starts sketchy, but then you get to the end, and it's talking about like these Nephilim, these giants, if you will, and, uh, and they were these men of great renown, these heroes of old so so maybe this isn't too bad right well the very next verse that talks about what has been happening and specifically what's happening here tells us this the lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time so that gives us a picture into what's happening here that this is not at all good, right? And then immediately afterwards, there's the flood where God basically wipes every living thing except for two of each animal and Noah and his family off the earth. Now, the, what's happening here is that the spiritual beings who existed and who were cast down to earth uh, liked how our daughters looked and they decided to take them and their offspring became these giants these nephilim that the bible refers to here in genesis 6 come on we experience the same temptation all the time don't we oh i really like how that looks i really like how that feels i really like how that tastes right so i'm just gonna take it has anybody else ever seen this happening in our world? Has anybody else ever seen this happening in your own heart? I just really want this thing. I'm going to take it. So here, um, our enemy's tactic is to reduce life down and make it all about your desires and my desires. Hey, and, and we do this, don't we? We do this with our kids. We do this in our schools. Hey, what do you want? And then once, once a kid answers that question, or once some, then we say, you know what? You just need to follow your heart. Okay, but is that a problem if the desire of your heart and my heart, the inclination of it is only evil all the time and we just want what we want, you know, forgetting about our God? Yeah, absolutely, this is a problem. Now, is it always bad to follow your heart? Well, I think it depends if a heart has been given to and transformed by our Lord Jesus Christ, I think it's okay. But if not, we've got to be careful with all the fleeting things that your heart and my heart desires. Amen? Do you know that the average American has $8,000 in credit card debt? Right? And, and, for some of you, you think that's like a ton of money. Others of you, you might think, well, that's not that much money. But when you're paying 24% interest, it's way more money, right? Because you pay hundreds of dollars a month to service that debt and it never goes down. That's a lot of money. Um, I want what I want and I want it now. That's how we live and that's a problem. Here are the results of living that way. Genesis 6, 7 says this, so the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, for I regret that I have even made them. Now, after the flood, God did make a covenant with Noah, right? He said, I will never do this again. I just, we can't do this anymore. 
Um, and, and, but this provides, I think, some important context for us, right? For those who, who say this, have you heard this? Oh, things are just getting worse and worse and worse nowadays, right? Oh my gosh, really close to the beginning, things were so bad, God had to do a start over, right? And the, and the inclination of people's hearts was only evil all the time. I know there's lots of nefarious things out there, but there's also good and godly things that the people of God have, have seen come to earth, right? Like th- this is what Jesus taught us to pray, right? That, that heaven would come crashing in to earth, and that's what we are here to do. Um, this also, I think, stresses to all of us how serious this kind of stuff is, uh, how serious it should be to us, and how serious it is to our God. Okay, we have one last fall. So we had the Genesis 3 fall, the Genesis 6 fall. I want you to also think with me about the Genesis 11 fall. Listen to these few words. The text says this. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So what exactly is happening here. Remember we talked last week about how our access to God had, had been taken away, right? We were, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. Eden was really this very unique place that was kind of the space between heaven and earth where, where they could walk with God in, in the cool of the day, where there would be spiritual beings and human beings, right? So it's this weird space between heaven and earth. And God, in his grace, after Adam and Eve chose to sin and rebel against God, he expelled them from the garden where they had access to these same spiritual beings and had the same access to God because he didn't want them to eat from the tree of life and have eternal life in this fallen state. It was actually a a mercy from God to let us as fallen sinful humans actually come to our end at some point so that we could experience eternity as God intended, right? So our access to God and our access to the spiritual realm had been diminished or taken away as a result of our choices and our actions. So instead of taking God's path back, what we see here is that people say, we're going to figure it out on ourselves. We can build a tower and get back there. We can, we can get back to Eden. We can get back to heaven. So here, our enemy's tactic is to puff us up and make life all about your abilities and my abilities, right? You can do this. Have you heard this? Does it feel good when someone tells that to you? I mean, it does for me, right? But, but, and that's okay, but when we take it another step, you can do this. You don't need God. In fact, God's kind of old-fashioned. Oh, man, that book he wrote, he wrote that a long time ago, right? It's probably outdated by now anyway. In fact, you kind of looking to God has probably held you back. You can do this, and doing it without God would be better. This is one of the reasons people of faith have warred so much against, you know, thoughts and conversations about evolution, And it's not because we can't see signs of the evolutionary process in nature. It's because when this theory first came on the scene, a a very prominent, well-known atheist actually said these words, Oh, finally, I can now be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Because up until this point, there was no real theory. So if you were an atheist, you still couldn't explain how things happened. And so this theory became kind of the, oh, now I can sort of say that as my way and I don't have to sort of cheat myself in my mind. Again, we make it all about us and our knowledge and our abilities. This tactic, 
This tactic suggesting that we are better, that we are smarter, and that we are stronger than than God, because I don't even know if he even exists. This is devastating. And we see signs of it everywhere in our culture, right? It's all about he's not real, he doesn't exist. And so the consequences of buying into this lie we see in Genesis 11, 8 tell us, so the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building that city. When we position ourselves in opposition to God. Listen, God is, God is not opposed to us. God is not our enemy. We've been talking about who our enemy is, right? God is not our enemy. In fact, God's posture to you and to me is, is one where he is for us. He is with us. He loves us. He believes in us. But when you and I choose to stand in opposition to God, we are, are placing ourselves in a, in a spot where he exists opposed to us. But it's our choice. It's because we have done that. So here's, here's the good news. Thinking about all these falls, right? People making things about them, about their desires, what makes them feel good, what they want. I can do it. My abilities. Listen, our, our only choice here is who we pick. And we get to pick evil. We get to pick us, which is kind of the same thing or we get to pick God. Because even in light of all the falls and all this brokenness, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to fix everything. And it's because of our faith and our hope in the Son of God who was God, who came to this earth, who lived a perfect life and was willing to die for the sacrifice once for all for our sins. That that all of this is, can be behind us. So, so what does it look like to, to accept what Jesus did for us? What does it look like to pick God in a practical sense in our lives? Well, I, I want to give you just a few things, but let's start here. These falls, if you want to think about what they are, these falls include both a human and spiritual rebellion, right? What's happening that we can see in our human realm, what's happening like we talked last week in the spiritual realm as we're making these decisions and choices. So both a human and spiritual rebellion that leaves humanity, all of us, and the world in a worse place than it was before, right? This is what a fall is. Uh, Humans and fallen spiritual beings are teaming up to try to beat God. And think about this, like, let's try to beat God, a God whose power is unending and who has already won. Man, who in the world would ever do this? So what it, what's in this for me if I'm going to join up with you to try to sort of do this? Now, before I kind of you, answer that question, l- let's say this. So if you have a little kid or grandkid or whatever, and finally, like, they're getting their balance, right, and they can kind of stand on two feet, and then they start, it's not really walking at this point, but, you know, like, a, a, right? <laughs> they start walking, And kind of our hope, our only goal is that they will not, right? And then you get a little bit older at the other end of the spectrum, and maybe your your balance is not what it once was. You guys have kind of, you know, been concerned for me because I've had a couple close calls on the edge of our stage this last month, and you're like, oh my goodness. And, you know, I wear these shoes kind of every week now because they have orthotics because this summer I got plantar fasciitis. Again, I'm getting old, right? Whatever. Uh, so you guys are like, ah, oh, right? But you get to the other end of the spectrum and maybe you're a little bit more brittle and prone to like breaks and other kinds of things, right? And so you're moving about carefully because really even there, the only goal is not to what? Right? You don't want to fall. And the same thing is true spiritually, isn't it? Where, where man, like we, we are... We are looking at Jesus and we are seeing him more clearly than maybe we have for a while or maybe more clearly than we ever have. And the only goal is that we continue and do not fall. Let's not fall. So man, if if these sort of fallen angels, these spiritual beings want us to sort of participate with them in rebellion against God, what is in it for us? Well, here's what's in it, right? 
You can have the same outcomes. You can know what God knows. You can make it about you. You can just get there much quicker and you can do it on your own terms. Even though what we get isn't the same as when we do it God's way. It's twisted. It's mutilated. So there's three things that we see not only in the Bible that are things that that people, that us humans have received that we did not receive in God's way. And when we employ these, we almost always leave our world and humanity worse than when we got it. And we not only see these things in the Bible, but we also read about these things in the history of Babylon and Assyria and Egypt in Mesoamerica. We see it in North mythology, the origin stories from the Japanese people and even in the writings of Plato. Three things we got and that we use in the wrong way. And when we do, the result is rebellion, again, that leaves humanity and the world in a worse place than it was before. Number one is this, the knowledge of metalworking for weapons in war. We've already alluded to this. The Bible tells us, right? Like some people put their trust in horses and chariots, but we are told as God's people to put our trust in, in the Lord, right? And so horses and chariots and spears and bullets and might and war and fear. Uh, these are tactics and tools given to us not in good and godly ways, but from these lesser fallen gods to create what I call anti-kingdom, right? God has said, as my people, here's what I'm inviting you into. Here's how I want you to live. And when we live in those ways, it brings the kingdom of God to earth. And when we live in these ways of anti-kingdom, when we decide, I'm just gonna, that's a bad guy, I'm just gonna kill them, right? It results in the opposite. Listen, We've, we've thought this for a long time. It's not true. Might does not equal right. Just because you have enough power, just because you're strong enough, just because you can does not mean that you should. Uh, and it's true in this way. I, I've had people this month come to me and say, Rob, I really struggle with the thought that just because it has flesh on, uh, or if it has flesh on, it's not my enemy. Because I know people, I've seen people who are pure evil, and every inclination inside of me is to want to eliminate those people because it would be better for everyone in the world. Listen, that never makes things better or more godly. We may, in those instances, have a moment where we feel like we got the job done, But what happens inside our hearts when we participate in these things and what happens in our world when we participate in these things, there's always escalation and retaliation. Things never get better and always get worse. Number two is this, the ability to manipulate plants and and turn them into drugs. Now, I'm going to date myself, but some of you will know what I'm talking about here. So Jim Morrison, when he was singing and writing for The Doors, would talk about just these, these powerful lyrics that would come to him after he had used illicit drugs. You know, and, and there are people even today that will say things like, oh man, you know, I was high and I saw things and I knew things that I'd never seen before and I really couldn't know in any other way. So whether it's drugs or magic or potions or spells, we see these things a lot culturally. What's going on here? Well, They're using these things to regain access to the spiritual realm that we as humans for this time were removed from, we were kicked out of on our own terms. It's like Babel. I can get back there myself in my own way. I've heard people talk about this where they've had spirit guides, right? They they said some things, they did some things, they took some things, and they had a spirit guide or, or, or they had basically an angel of light, right? One of these fallen spiritual beings, one of these demons who was speaking in to them, who was advising them. Listen, church, don't do this. Don't do this. It will never, ever, ever produce anything better for you or for those around you. It will always pull you down and cause you to fall. The Old Testament refers to this kind of stuff as necromancy or divination, and it expressly forbids it. 
And then here's the, the last one that, that we, we were given, but not in godly ways. Illicit sexual acts. And I think it's important to say this. This is, I think, the primary way that our culture actually engages with sex. Sex in our culture is all about feelings, needs. When you look at the pornography statistics inside and outside the walls of the church, our culture is addicted to pornography. We see more people are enslaved today than ever before in history, child sex trafficking. And we might think, well, that's in other parts of the world or other places. Actually, more sex trafficked victims pass through Ohio than any other state in the union because we have an interstate that connects New York and Chicago. Talk about football just started last week. You know what? Anytime there's a Super Bowl, there are more prostitutes and child sex victims trafficked to those cities just to provide for the pleasure of the people who are going to that game and the things they want to experience. You know, this is why the Bible says, like in the, in the Exodus, when people are being delivered from Egypt, right? It's like, leave Egypt. Leave Egypt with, with their witchcraft and, and their slavery and, their, and their, their power and might and war machines and their child sacrifices and all of their illicit sexual rituals. Leave that. Don't participate in those things if you are one of God's people. Instead, participate in the kingdom of God. And so with this illicit sexual acts, this beautiful gift that God gave us to knit us together with our one person for life and and that should be used in that context to spread and to multiply his image because of how we've used it, that, that has become marred beyond all recognition in our culture. And instead of a thing of life and beauty, we have turned it into a thing of death and darkness. Remember, church, we have an enemy. And when we make life all about us and our desires and our abilities apart from God, we are playing into our enemy's plans and his tactics. That impulse to want to kill, even sometimes in the name of the Lord. That impulse to want to find paths other than Jesus back to God. That impulse to embrace all sexual expression. All of it as participating in what our enemy is up to. Can you see that? And rejecting what God is inviting us to create along with him. So as we think about this enemy I want you to watch this video again one more time, knowing that it's our enemy talking to us. I've done this church thing for a long time now, and I think I've got something important to say about it, about your expectations, and about you. Here's the deal with the church you are in right now. There could be something deep in your heart that changes today. We hope for that. In fact, we pray for that. But honestly, in my experience, the chances are, well, kind of slim. Now, I know that sounds a bit harsh, even blunt, but I don't know if there's much that can really change a person in 60 minutes. We all know that real change takes a lifetime. They'll ask you to focus on God, and that's a great thing. But it'll be almost impossible to really focus, especially with everything going on in your life. They'll ask you not to be apathetic, I assure you, Nobody's apathetic about Jesus. You've just heard this message over and over. Now, I really don't want to sound negative, so when they sing, sing along. When they pray, close your eyes. And when they study the Bible, follow along. But as you do these things, my advice to you is simple. Really simple. Be careful how much you allow your heart to lean in, to lean in toward God to lean in toward the other people in the room. Oh, there will be a time for you to lean in more, but it might not be today. So hey, thanks for taking the time to listen. I don't consider myself an expert or anything. I've just been around long enough to have a little experience in the church. I hope you have a great day and that this church meets your expectations. And if you need anything at all, or you just wanna talk, I'll be around. 
We're going to close today by, by singing a really simple song that, that just says these words, Lord, I need you. And I don't know, some of you might, might be like me, where, where you have maybe been tricked a little bit, right? You have fallen victim to some of our enemy's schemes and plans and tactics, right? And, and you have kind of, well, I've lived this way. And, and in this moment, God has allowed you to see more clearly that that is not his way. It's not his path. It's not what he's inviting his people to. And so, so maybe today for some of us is the day where we say, okay, God, you know what? It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by your spirit. And I'm no longer going to live my life in the ways of the kingdom of darkness, but I'm going to take my stand, God, and I'm going to live in your ways. But I need your help, Jesus. I need you. And so I'm just going to pray a quick prayer for us. But if you're here today and you, and you want to join me in that to say, nope, I am, I am going to resist, I'm going to reject the tactics of our enemy. I know more of what they are and I'm going to take a stand for God. Everyone's looking around. We're going to keep looking around. If you want to say that, we're going to sing in just a minute. Would you just stand? I'm standing. Would you stand with me? I want to reject the enemy's tactics and I'm taking a stand for Jesus. And so Jesus, today I pray as, as we declare by singing this song together, making it our prayer, Lord, I need you. Every one of us needs you. We need each other as your body and your people, God, in order to, to grow and to live and to flourish. And God, we confess that, that while we get our minds messed up and we get our lives messed up, it is not by might or by power or by intellect or anything else, but Jesus it is only by your spirit. And so as we sing this song declaring how much we need you, I just pray that you would fill us, that you would send us into this world, and that you would use us in mighty ways. We ask together in Jesus' name. Amen.